you all gave such a good sermon right now. Thanks a lot. I have to follow you. Man, can we thank them again? And the thing I like most about what you did wasn't just how you sang it, but how Dr. Babcock put it together and framed it within the scripture passage you're about to hear. When, when a worship service flows well, everything speaks to the scripture, and your song did just a beautiful job. Thank you. And now we turn to Psalm 127. In a difficult passage, because it doesn't say what our 21st century sensibilities would like it to say. And still, may we glean wisdom and knowledge from God's word. Listen once again. Unless the Lord builds the house, those who labor in it labor in vain. Unless the Lord guards the city, the guards keep watch in vain. It is in vain that you rise up early and go late to rest, eating the bread of anxious toil. For he gives sleep to his beloved. Sons are indeed a heritage from the Lord, the fruit of the womb a reward. Like arrows in the hand of a warrior are the sons of one's youth. Happy is the one who has a quiver full of them. He shall not be put to shame when he speaks with his enemies in the gate. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. Dear Lord, we pray that our life, our very souls, have been anchored in you. We ask, dear Lord, that you will bless us as we seek to truly be grounded in you at such a depth level that no matter what happens in this world, no matter what waves toss us about, we will be able to hold firm in your love, in your care, in your almighty power. For we ask this in your holy name. Amen. I have a confession to make. I like mobster movies. I mean, I really like them. The Godfather 1 and 2, wonderful. Nobody liked 3. Uh, Donnie Brasco's one that you need to watch if you haven't. It's a good one, and it's not the one everybody watches. I love The Sopranos. And you can just name your own. Public Enemy goes back. Do you know that I have a special relationship with uh, John Dillinger? My My first church in northern Wisconsin is in the movie Public Enemy because Dillinger, the FBI, tried to shoot it out and he went out the back door of of the the Little Bohemia Inn and down along the lake, which is right uh, less than two blocks, no, one block from our house where we lived in our first church and snuck out the back way, cut almost through our yard with baby face Nelson, and they got away and kept on going. Then in the second church was in Merrillville, Indiana, which is right next to Crown Point, Indiana, which is where Jill and I and Hannah lived, and that's where John Dillinger broke out of jail. So I'm waiting for what's going to happen in Des Moines. (laughs) But I've always liked mob movies, but one of the reasons that I get such a kick out of these movies is how they can compartmentalize their faith with their actions. You watch most of these mob movies, and you know, on Saturday night or Sunday morning, they're going to Mass, they're going to church, they're confessing, and they're doing all these good works, and then, you know, when they're not busy killing everybody. And yet they can compartmentalize so that their faith and their their actions in the rest of their world don't seem to have a problem. And that is a problem. Compartmentalization is something that should be watched and worked on continually. In two of my four churches, half the churches I've served as the pastor, we've had issues right before I came and one during my time in a church where we had sexual misconduct issues with staff. And over and over again, you'll find in these situations that it comes down to com- these people compartmentalizing their life to such a degree that they can live holy lives in one part of their life and they can do despicable things in another part of their life and totally separate them so that they can rationalize horrible things over here while still doing holy things over here. 
and the more they compartmentalized, the less anchored they were to God, but the more they could rationalize the inappropriateness. It requires our whole selves in order to make life work. Now, I want to address the second half of that psalm before I go any further because that second half of the psalm, I hope, hurt you as much to hear it as it did me to have to read it. There were a couple things in that psalm that I believe caused by societal change to compartmentalize life inappropriately, even in the ancient world. What am I speaking of? Sons are a reward, and there should be a quiver full of them. Well, what about the daughters? We have, we have been in the history of the Christian church, and before that, the people of faith, very patriarchal and inappropriate. And so when you read these, we have to remember the setting in the ancient world that they were written in, and we have to understand that we need to change and even sometimes ask forgiveness for this Bible. I remember a cartoon one time, many years ago, and it had a mentalist. It said mentalist, and there was this guy wearing a turban and his hands are over a crystal ball, and it said underneath mentalist. And then you had another guy in a black suit and a black tie with his hands over, hovering over a Bible, and it said funda mentalist. <laughs> As if somehow the word was coming out of this Bible and into our heads in some sort of powerful way that you didn't even need to open it you just need to carry it around and if you're going to do that get a floppy one like I have it's more impressive that's what Jimmy Schwager used to use and that's why I carry one because you can flip it further too <laughs> I don't know where that came from anyway in the Presbyterian church and Central College is part of the reformed tradition which means we're continually reforming that society changes and we move in a trust in the Holy Spirit not to take these old words and literally try to make them fit, but we trust in the Holy Spirit to continually reform us so we're not bound by the sins or prejudices or in unjust systems that were adherent in the ancient world and we do not continue to make those things prevalent today. We don't fundamentalize the Bible. We open it and we trust in the Holy Spirit to move it, to guide it, and take us to ever better, more wonderful, and more loving places. That's why I can cringe while I read Psalm 127 but I can still read it because I believe the Holy Spirit is going to take that and move it to a new place. Having said that, there's a reason why it was said. There was power in what was said in Psalm 127 because it didn't compartmentalize the word into one little place. The thing that was mentioned was the builders receive and are blessed because God works through them. The guards in the tower guarding the city. The Holy Spirit protected and, and guided those guards to protect well. So even parents with sons and daughters. And even if you don't have children. In the ancient world, if you had to have children because you had the huge Assyrian army to the north, you had the gigantic Babylonian army to the east, and you had the incredibly powerful Egyptian army to the south and then you had this tiny little group of people called the Israelites well they needed to have as many children as they could have so they could get big enough to defend themselves we don't worry about that now there are almost too many of us so we have to reinterpret the scripture in a new way and it to meet a new time please do not be offended by it transform it but what they were all gathering together to do was for the writer to say that God meets us in our ordinary lives. You may feel extraordinary as a parent or grandparent, but there are a whole lot of us parents. It's an ordinary thing that we do, but we can make it extraordinary. 
That's why parenting was mentioned. Mentioned with the other working, ordinary jobs like being a carpenter or being a guard or anything else. When God's Holy Spirit blesses everyone, including ordinary people, doing ordinary jobs and making them extraordinary, when they anchor themselves in the ground of faith so that every part of their lives is true to the gospel of Jesus Christ, or in this case, the Hebrew Bible, then we feel the joy and the power of God working in our lives. I have a dear friend, and he's going through a really tough time right now. We got together, and he was saying, it's so frustrating because I go to church, and I went to a small group meeting at one of the church that he attends, and he said, everybody else seems to have it together but me. And they all talk about how the God works through their hearts and, and God's the center of their lives. Well, I've been a Christian all my life, but I don't feel it the way they do. And I said, well, that's because they're probably lying. <laughs> and he looked at me and he said, what? And I said, well, they don't mean to lie. I said, you know, and some of them may have that, be in that moment at that time, really feeling God's movement. But if they claim that God feels really close to them every minute of every day, they're lying for Christ. Because no one feels that intimacy that powerfully every minute of every day. Not even in the Bible. And these people made the final draft. Did they feel God's presence every minute of every day profoundly and strong? So... You're going through a hard time, I told my friend. I said, the way in which you develop a relationship with God is to anchor it in faith. But let's talk about what it means to be anchored in faith. I didn't say anchored in faith on Friday. I just said it because that was their song. But I said something like it. I said, there are a few things that we do as people of faith. And one of those is we practice I was an awful basketball player because I didn't practice and everyone else grew and I didn't. I, could, I couldn't control how, that I never got beyond five foot nine, but I could control the fact that I didn't practice as much as I should have. So I went in and did other things where I practiced a little bit more. But if you've ever been an athlete, you know that you can't just get out there and run a marathon without practicing. Why do you expect that you can be a f strong person of faith without practicing either? And so I said to my friend, what do you do to practice your faith? You need to start. It's in the moments where you have the least amount of time. Martin Luther used to say, you need to pray eight hours a day. And if you're busy, you need to pray 16 hours a day. It's that important. He was exaggerating for emphasis. But the key is to anchor oneself in the gospel through constant and vigilant relationship with God. And I know you're busy, so am I. So, sometimes it doesn't mean sitting down with a devotional book in your Bible and reading for an hour a day. I can't do that and I get paid to do it. It means inviting God in, remembering to talk about your day and how God will bless it while you're brushing your teeth in the morning. It means, what do I do as on my drive to work when I start feeling the anger of somebody going 20 miles an hour under the speed limit in the fast lane on the 235? Remember, I'm preaching it. I don't have to live it. <laughs> and don't ask Jill about my road rage experiences. But in that moment of just, all of a sudden you catch yourself getting really upset and then you just say, stop. And if you remember to say, God, call me. And it's amazing how many times just saying the word God in that moment in a nice way <laughs> brings down the anxiety level and makes you set and anchored again. There are so many times throughout the day where as you're walking through and you're already thinking about the sixth thing on your list, 
How many times I've passed Stacy and Joan in the office and barely grunted hello. And I've had to turn around and come back and stick my head around the corner and say good morning and then talk. Because they are important and more important than probably nine of the ten things on my list that are already late. And when you go to work or you go to class and you walk in, you represent Jesus Christ wherever you go. You don't have to have reverend behind your name in order to represent Christ to the world. And we do it not in grandiose ways or in sermonizing. We do it in the little things that anchor us. A world is made by a million tiny moments of remembering to bring love, hope, and faith to your day and to the people around you. And I agonize over all the times where I wasn't anchored. And I brought anger and anxiety and frustration to a meeting, to my family. I can't tell you how many times I brought it home. And now that Hannah isn't around, my daughter, I wish I could have so many of those back. When I just wasn't there, even when I was there. Spiritual moments missed. You don't have to be hit by lightning. In fact, I think Martin Luther and maybe one or two other people can claim they've had this religious moment where they were horrible and then bam, God spoke to them. That isn't my experience. And I'm willing to bet for most of you it isn't yours. God bless those people that get hit by it and just are changed and transformed immediately. I'm I, I'm jealous. But that isn't the only means of having spiritual enlightenment. For most of us, it's like running a marathon. It means tying your shoes at 5.30 in the morning and getting out on that road when you're tired and you're walking like this because you can't have coffee before you run. And it means doing it when you don't feel like it. I love Mary Decker Slaney. She was, remember, her, she was in the Olympics and she was a miler. And one time she was interviewed and they said, how, do you really love running? And she said, no. And they looked at her, how can you do it for a living then? And she said, I like how I feel when I'm done running. And often that's the faith. In the moment you're doing it, it seems like work. Dragging your rear end here on Sunday morning when you just don't feel like it. Being out and coming on a Wednesday night because the kids are dragging you along. And yet, it's how you feel when you're done doing it that anchors you. I love that passage from Romans 8.28 that says, For all things work together for good for those that love God. And it's the word together. When you say it over and over so I could remember it with all of you looking at me. Together seems to be the most important word. To be anchored in the faith means to do it together. I was a runner in high school because they wouldn't let me play in the basketball team past ninth grade. And if I had to run in the summer, we, moved, we lived at my family's cabin in Minnesota, and it was so hard because I had no one to run with, and I didn't do it as well. I ran so much better when we went back up to the range and I was running with the guys on my team. Because we dragged each other out of bed. Because by golly, Paul Brandt was not going to run an extra mile than I would run. So I'd get up and meet him there and be grumble at him all morning. While we ran and prepared and practiced. And I know people always say, I feel God in nature. Well, so do I, but that isn't the only place you find God. I really like just sitting home with a cup of coffee on Sunday morning and I feel God in my life then. Well, yeah, so do I. But you can do that on Saturday morning, Friday night. Sunday morning, you got to be here because we live it in community where we're accountable to each other, where we push each other. Together you can do a little bit. But when we are all together in the faith, anchored as one in the body of Christ, 
We can do great things. We do great things. You all, every one of you has a gorgeous voice, I bet. But listen to you together. Oh my gosh. It's just, oh, listening to you guys. You're so much better together than you ever could be alone. And that's the same thing that happens in the church. We are anchored here. That's why Christ calls us together here. We don't compartmentalize our lives. It isn't just a little bit here and I can be different here. We feel the faith in God through Jesus Christ. When everything from brushing our teeth to meeting someone in our day to being in worship is where we find God. Bless each other. Love each other. Forgive ourselves. And try again. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen.